Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to episode 13 of the Gitcast podcast. Just a heads up, this will be, well it will most likely be the, um, I don't know if it definitely will be, but it will most likely be the last episode of this Gitcast podcast series before Christmas this year. Um, so uh, there may be a chance you might not see what an episode of this until uh, just after the 25th. In which case, I do apologise, but, uh, I mean, Phil's going off to the B- Berlin for Christmas, and I'll be up in London for Christmas without m- the use of my desktop, so, if possible, I'll try to get a couple of vlogs out over the Christmas period, but this will probably be the last uh, podcast until just after the Chris Day or Boxing Day, possibly. And... Um, and when, actually, I was going to ask you, when do you think you'll be back from Berlin? Well, all that's rather up in the air at the moment. I might be back as early as sort of mid-January or something, because uh, I may have a job interview. Yeah, with the civil service, you said, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, good luck with that, anyway. Thank you. Yeah, no, so um, so me and Phil have decided uh, that we kind of get each other bottles of drinks as like late Christmas presents in January, probably around the time that you have a crack at that thing, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Yeah. It could happen sort of any time between uh, sort of late February and mid mid January, late February. But in early February, I'll be volunteering to work with uh, um, with the uh, group known as Pesticide Action Network. All oh, right. Okay. You're, yeah, because you're not studying uh, history this academic year, are you? In your MA? No, no, I'm not. I'm doing an LLM in uh, environmental law. Yeah, I guess. I, guess... I just weren't any history degrees that really interested me. Yeah, that's the main reason why I chose contemporary history because it was nice and broad in general. It wasn't like the more specific ones at MA level weren't. Yeah, again, same. Just didn't really catch me too much. Apart from, like I said, contemporary history was the only one that really did. Yes, indeed. Hang on a minute. I'm just trying to put a, lo- a label on uh, my tog every, to go in with. Every time we do this, you always forget to do it before we start. Well, I'm not doing that. I'm, I have remembered it this time. Unfortunately, it seems I can only buy them with gold these days. Any, no, you can buy them with uh, credits. Can you? Yeah, you can. Uh, let me just check. She says stars. Uh, maybe. Yeah, huh. I don't know. I don't have enough gold to do it, unfortunately. Oh, well. I'll have to get myself some gold at some point and just buy. All right, well, we can try going in with uh, our togs anyway, as it is. All right. All right, so, All right. what have you been doing over the last week, as is the introduction of many of these podcasts? Well, I have been very busy with researching for various essays that I'm going to have to write over the Christmas break, as well as preparing for my final presentation exam, which is happening tomorrow, uh, Friday, as it is. Yeah, good Um, Yeah, thank you. Yeah, how about you? Have you got any sort of exams or anything coming up for Christmas? No, because I'm doing my MA part-time, it means that uh, my assessments are more spread out. I've only got my uh, dissertation coming up in second year of studies um, as I th- and I think I've also maybe got a sitting exam but I think again that's probably only in second year and as far as I can tell in first year all I've got is two 5,000 word essays one of which I've got a hand in on the 18th of January um, I'm going around the uh, stage uh, at this moment of like trying to think up a concept of like an essay plan which is forming itself quite nicely in my mind but um it's um it's like an old thing i like i've realized over the years is like when you have big tasks like that uh, it's best just to assess it against the other tasks you've got coming up in the foreseeable future how difficult they'll be in comparison to one another and then when you tackle each task just approach it piece by piece by piece so you can organize yourself and do each bit in timely order Yes, indeed. Now, I'll be having to do that because I have multiple essays and so on due. I've just had to prioritise, and, yeah, you know, I'm sort of quite well on the way to having it all uh, sort of down to rights. But, uh, yeah, now, other than academic stuff, I've been 
involved in various sort of social activities for the end of term with all my clubs and so on. I know. We had rather a nice evening on Monday, didn't we, when we went to the Sci-Fi and Horror Film Society. Oh yeah, that was great, where we, um, where we, we inevitably watched um, the theme of the week for this one was uh, Christmas, and um, I haven't done a review uh, on my blog in a while, um, but I'm going to be doing one to what we watched uh, this past Monday there, which was the Christmas special from Blackadder, where he basically does a reverse version of Scrooge and uh, from the Christmas Carol story, and essentially makes him start as a really nice man at the beginning of the uh, TV special episode, and then by the end of it, Rowan Atkinson is just basically the most nasty, spirited bugger. It's, um, it was pretty funny, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it was. It's one of my favourites, definitely. Yeah. I hadn't watched Blackadder in so long, actually. No, me neither. I think... Actually, that's not true. I watched the uh, Tudor series last year sometime. Yeah, but that's not really uh, Blackadder, is it? I mean, it's kind of got the same motifs and sort of, like, style. Yeah, it is. Is it? Yeah, there's a Blackadder Tudors series. Blackadder 2, I think they call it. Oh, right. Oh, that one. Yeah, sorry, my mistake. I was thinking of the actual Tudors series, but, um... Yeah, so I haven't watched that in many years. Yeah, I think my I wasn't really that big a fan of it. No, it was alright, but it had it had its flaws, yeah. but I think it was still pretty good as a historical drama. But, um, yeah, no, I think I was just going hand, head on pants doofy for a second, so I didn't realise which series you were actually talking about. Um, but yeah, no, that is also a good one, actually, as well, yeah. Oh, dear, KV2, our arch enemy. Um, yeah, I... I was going to ask, we've watched, I'm, I'm, but uh, sorry, I was going to say, I'm going to be doing a written review of uh, that episode of Blackadder on my blog in the next few days, so uh, I'll, I'll leave a link to that in the video, I'll leave a link to my blog in the video description below if people want to see it, but um, one thing I was going to ask you actually, considering we've watched a large different variation of like styles and formats of movies and TV shows over this term at the Sussex Sci-Fi and Horror Society, um, yes. What one would you say has, in your eyes, probably been the best one we've seen this term? Huh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm. I didn't really like uh, the sequel to The Evil Dead that we watched that one time. Um, because it just wasn't my thing. I did rather like um the thing. Mm. Uh, by how and who was the director? John Carpenter. Yes, John Carpenter's the thing, yes. That was probably one of the better ones. Or what was the first one that we saw together? That's a good question, because... Um, I... I went there for like the first one or two sessions of this term. And you only joined me about two or three weeks in. Yes. I just remember what it was. Oh... Uh, Oh, I can just bring up the um, Facebook page of um, the group and um, see what it, what the uh, theme for that week was. Because basically, for those of who those at home who don't know, the Soft Six Sci-Fi and Horror Society does this awesome thing where they each um, each week when they're running during term time, they get um, up a bunch of uh, like a mixture of both sci-fi and horror films but they all pertain to a certain theme of the week be it spoofs female leads um that sort of thing um so there's always a bit of variation week in week out which i which i've always quite liked about it ever since i started attending it last academic year um let's see so this past week was christmas um the one that got away was the week before that Supernatural was the week before that. Oh, I know what I like the most. It was the episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer because I've never actually seen that before. Oh yeah, that was um, that was not this past week, but the one before. So that was um, mm. week eleven. Yeah, that that was a good one actually. We watched um, we watched the one where she um, where Buffy absorbs demon blood and starts to hear the thoughts of other people. That was a really good episode. Yes. And then after that, uh, you had to leave, but I saw the episode, um, uh, the uh, episode where, uh, I think, what was it called, uh, Silence? 
Hush. Or no, Hush, that's it. Hush, yes, where uh, the gentlemen, these uh, strange creatures, sort of a bit like, look a bit like, Doc, it's all a bit sort of Doctor Who-ish, sort of monster of the week, and these ones are creatures that take away people's ability to make noise so you can't scream when they're coming at you. Yeah, that that make, that make, yeah, I think that is probably the one, yeah. Yes, indeed. Now that was great. That was good. I think I remember the week that you joined me. Actually, I think it was um, Creatures Week, which I think was something like. I think I'm pretty sure that was week three of the. Um, yes, it was. Yeah, and I remember that was the week that we saw John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982 with a. Uh, what's his name? Um, Kurt Russell with a beard and a yes. mighty flamethrower. That was a cracking film. Yes, it was. That was probably one of my sort of favourites from the whole affair, yes. I think for me, my favourite that we saw all the time was um, probably um, Silence of the Lambs. Or what about um, Cabin in the Woods? Actually, I think that was the first one I saw. Then the week after that was uh, the Kurt Russell film, The Thing. No, that Kurt Russell thing came before. Are you sure? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Oh, well, fair enough then. And I definitely know you came with me to see the um, Kurt Russell thing. Yes, no, but I saw Cabin in the Woods as well. Yeah. No, for me, the I think the best thing I saw all the time was definitely... Um, it had to be um, Silence of the Lambs. It's just an absolute classic for films. Psychologically intense, quite scary. It's, oh, it's genuinely brilliant. I think what the one I liked the least was myself. Um, I think for me, probably the one I liked the least actually was the film we saw in. Um, what was it? I think it was week ten actually. Um, Arrival. Because oh that yeah, it's hard to leave halfway through that. Yeah, because you had some previous um, engagements. Um, yes, around. I did. But yeah, no, I um, oh, I stayed to watch it, and I fucking I regretted it so much because it's just. I mean, technically speaking, it's well made, but it's just so boring. Um, it's just doesn't stand out, and the shots are just oh, they're just there to look nice. It's just um, uh, God, yeah, no, it's it's just really not. It's not anything noteworthy. That's the unfortunate thing. It's just um, it's just a really bog standard sci-fi film, apart from. Re you know, admittedly, well-made uh, sound and uh, camera, uh, uh, essentially, but that's yes. on only in like the most flatline sort of sense. Yes, indeed. I have to say, though, I liked their core concept, which was uh, how would you actually communicate with aliens? Mm. So trying to present something a bit more realistic in terms of how uh, people would respond to a sudden alien arrival. But I have to say, I think my least favourite week was the week when we watched uh, the first, well, I think it was TV show week, maybe it was week seven or something, uh, we watched the first two episodes of the TV series Hannibal. Oh yeah, the sort of pre Like the prequel TV series to uh, Silence of the Lambs. I, um, I did a review of those two episodes on my blog that week as well. Again, same problems as Arrival. Technically, it was good, but just thematically, it just wasn't that interesting. Yes, and for someone who doesn't really sort of care that much for Silence of the Lambs, it wasn't really all that interesting. It wasn't really all that involving. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like for both me and you, like me, I really like the film. You're all just like, yeah, it's okay, but uh, we both agreed it was just really droll. It's like Mads Mikkelsen was completely underutilised and the main female character in it, who's in the series for a grand total of, I think, about 17 episodes. She's just... Uh, the I think it's the ginger-haired reporter woman's just thoroughly unlikable. Yes, indeed. Uh, shall we head into another battle, or what do you fancy? Uh, yeah, sure. I was just spectating the uh, 8015 just to give the viewers a bit of something to look at. Um, All right, cool. 
Yeah. I was just worried they were looking at sort of the interior of your garage while we were chatting. Oh, right. No, I wasn't doing that. I wouldn't be that cruel to them. Uh, what do you Fair want enough. to go in with next? Uh, tier 5 Churchills, perhaps? Sounds fine. So, building on from, like, uh, the end of term for um, the Sussex Sci-Fi and Horror Society and the fact that we the last thing we saw was um, the Christmas special for Blackadder. Yes. What do you have planned for your Christmas celebrations this year? Oh, well, I shall be returning to my family in Berlin. Mm. And uh, we shall likely be having a sort of quiet Christmas at home. Um, there'll be various engagements before and after that. I will be going to see some of my old friends from school, hang out with them for an evening. Um, then my father, who is the master of two different choirs, will have a couple of concerts that I will try to attend if possible and my little sister's uh, music teacher has arranged a sort of school Christmas concert at which my little sister will likely be performing so I shall go and see that unfortunately he arranged it on the night of one of my father's uh, Christmas carol services um, and he arranged it just one week in advance sort of in the busiest time of the year just kind of expected people to have nothing else on. It was quite strange. So it looks like uh, I shall be going to see that. It's, um, like, it's Christmas in Germany. Of course there are going to be people doing other things. Yeah, I know. It was weird. Well, there we go. I mean, how big of a thing again is um, Christmas in Germany? It's fairly big. Definitely as big as here. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, like, you know, after um, after the years of like being a mostly pagan country, it was like orthodox and uh, some parts um, Protestant Catholic as well, wasn't it? Well, Germany orthodoxy never orthodoxy never took hold in Germany. You no, know, Germany was previously Catholic and has since become heavily Protestant, at least for the most part. Yeah, I mean, I I know a fair bit about like the spread of like uh, Christianity during the, like, the Middle Ages in in Europe, but like less so to do with some certain countries, particularly Germany. Um, German history has never been a huge part of my knowledge, to be honest. Yes. Well, no, Germ northern Germany these days is Protestant, yeah. quite heavily so, and uh, southern Germany is mostly Catholic, so. is the gist of it. So, like, areas like Bavaria are, like, Catholic and such. Yes, that's right. Yes, and then during the Thirty Years' War, uh, but, yeah, the Germans, uh, the different German states fought each other with the Northerners being on the side of the Reformation, the Southerners being on the side of the Catholic Church. Yeah, that makes about sense. Yeah, yeah now that you remember it, I did uh, read up a bit a while ago on the Thirty Years' War, and there was a lot of mention of the Protestants in the north getting support from people like uh, King Gustavus Adolphus. Gustavus Adolphus, yes. Uh, of uh, Sweden, who, you know, considering Sweden's got quite a few Protestants there, and uh, they're usually quite an open sort of, like, country. Like, yeah, kind of made sense that he'd end up supporting them, uh, considering they were quite reformist and such. Uh, I mean... Yes, indeed. It was an in it was a fa It's a fascinating conflict for the Thirty Years' War, because it's... It's not just the usual traditional European enemies fighting against each other, but some of them are even fighting against not as traditional enemies on the basis of not just political issues or not even religious ones, but sometimes societal ones as well. It's a fascinating conflict. Indeed, yes. I had like several stages of like dominance from different countries. I mean, like at one point it was the Holy Roman Empire, and then it was Sweden, and then it was uh, Russia. France. And... Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's definitely a fascinating conflict. For me, it's like, in terms of like people being interested in it for historical study, it's kind of like to the uh, 1600s, what basically the uh, Korean War is to the 20th century. It's one of those ones that had a lot of impact on the world, but that people have kind of forgotten about a little bit. Yes, you're right. Okay, I'm about to die. There's no way on earth I can escape. Yeah, me and you are a little bit rusty at World of Tanks, I think. We haven't played it in a little while anyway. I mean, I played it recently, but um, mostly at higher tiers. Well, I got a kill. 
Yeah, well, at least you did more than I did. Well, actually, no, I got killed as well. Um, but yeah, no, if anyone isn't particularly interested by the gameplay in the background, you can just switch us off and in the uh, in the background and just listen to us talking. So um, it might be more uh, palatable based on the slightly rusty gameplay. <laughs> So, what have I been doing in planning for Christmas? Not much, really. I kind of same as you, really. I've just been planning to go back to the to the big capital and basically just chill out with some family, have some nice food, and just do some studying in preparation for my mid-year assessments. I think yeah. mine's probably going to be a bit s smaller scale, and I'm not really going to as many like you know musical events like karaoke's or receptions or something like that but um hmm. again generally the same idea for me it's just but my I think mine's probably just going to be a little bit more low key really considering my, uh uh probably christmas probably isn't as proportionally a big thing in my family as it is around yours but um yes i don't know i, I still really like christmas though it's like even though I'm, Religiously, I'm not um, Christian. Uh, you mean it's still a time of year I enjoy celebrating because uh, it's just nice to be around family and it's nice to give and get presents and just be cosily in the warm and uh, eating nice food. Yes, indeed. Actually, I'm pretty sure I've asked you this before, but as a vegetarian, what's your favourite thing about like Christmas dinner or Christmas food in general? Oh, um. I've always really liked uh, roasted parsnips and uh, stuffing. One like sage and onion stuffing. Oh, sage and onion stuffing. I thought I, I was thinking. Wait, hang on. Is he talking about pork stuffing? But then I was thinking. Wait, no. To these a vegetarian, you're an idiot. Um. Yeah, no. Sage stuffing is brilliant if made correctly. Um, yeah. That and like uh, sort of pastries and cranberry sauce is always nice. I think it's um, yeah, roast potatoes, roast onion. I think it's probably the same with me. Just so like uh, with me, I I quite like um, I quite like yeah, you know, I quite like pigs in blankets. I quite like chicken. I like really well done smoked salmon, mince pies, cranberry sauce with like uh, you know ro roast ham and all that. There's a couple of things I really don't like about Christmas though that are really traditional here, which is um, roasted parsnips. I generally don't really like all that much um, hmm. unless they're cooked superbly by like family members but even then it's not often and I also re I'm not that into turkey to be honest I'm really more of a man of either having a nice hawk of lamb or um, a big chunk of uh, roast la ham I'd say maybe even a yes. maybe even a top grade chicken but like I'm just not that into turkey it's just you can cook it succulently and you can also just dish it up with like mustard and uh, cranberry sauce and gravy and all that. But aside from that, it's just too dry and just boring, really, for me personally. Mm. Yeah, so I, even when I sort of ate meat, I didn't really like the turkey. Yeah. In fact, I think my father is the only one in our sort of family who really likes turkey. It's just but... a bit boring and dry, really, isn't it? Yeah, and I don't, I don't like the smell. I mean, a lot of meat, I will admit, I actually like the smell of it, but turkey, just no. Yeah, that's coming from, I mean, vegetarian of all people, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's just... And there's not a... I mean, it's not one of those meats you can't do a lot with. You can, I think, do a lot with turkey, because it's quite an adaptable bit, bit of food, but it's so bland and adaptable that it just kind of loses any point really i mean you might as well just go for chicken because at least that tastes of something if, to begin with yeah or else have sort of a nice big lamb roast well to be fair my mother normally does um a large kind of uh, beef and ale pie oh that sounds good as well yeah that uh, do you like brussels sprouts oh yeah Freaking love I Brussels used to sprouts. dislike them, but I've since discovered a sort of fondness for them. They're great. Like they're really good for you, and like they go really well with like a load of Christmas food. They're even, yeah. They're even good outside of the Christmas season as well. Sometimes, particularly around like October and November. So, yeah, I really like them. Hmm. I was going to say actually, I make a really nice um 
beef nail stew that you, has Brussels sprouts in it. So I know what your mum is uh, talking about when she makes them into a beef nail pie. But I um, yeah. But I'm trying to think: is there any like vegetarian alternative to that that would be like readily available to make? Huh. Yeah. Um. Well, normally, uh, sort of mushrooms form like uh, an alternative that I often have. Like I have mushroom gravy instead of sort of the beef gravy. Mm. Yeah, I have sort of roasted mushrooms. I mean, in general, like stuffing will serve the purpose of sort of being the really hearty bit of it but uh there's a, a sort of like you can get various types of smoked tofu that actually do a pretty good job of replacing a turkey that does sound pretty nice actually yeah or else a nut roast mm. that will often do the trick hmm hang on i quite like okay the take my shittest tank in the thing but i need to grind on it uh, i just uh don't say grind on it. It says mean grind it up. Oh uh, yeah, that's true. That has a that has a double meaning, doesn't it? Yes, quite um, modern, shall we say, uh, sexual connotations. So just be, <laughs> just be careful, particularly when you say that around the internet is all. Um, but yeah, I am. Um, I only really started eating nut roast in like the last probably couple of years, really. Um, but I've discovered, and I mean, it's one of those things that has a fine margin between screwing it up quite badly and making it really nicely. Because if you make it really nicely, it can be a fairly nice substitution for uh, like a meatloaf or something. And um, it's really nice, you know, with like gravy and tatties and carrots, onions, and broccoli and all that. But if you make it poorly, then it is just horrendous. Like it can just be really sour and overly crunchy, and it's just not nice. Hmm. What's your, your uh, ideal selection of nuts and uh, seeds for it, though, if you're making it? Oh, um, a little bit of hazel, just a tiny bit of walnut, uh, quite uh, a large portion of macadamia, uh, some cashews. Um, oh, gosh, what other kinds of nuts would I typically put in there? Um, yeah, like walnuts, fair bit. Um, in terms of seeds, like... Uh, I'd probably go with a lot of uh, sesame to sort of hold it all nicely together. Maybe some pumpkin seeds as well. Have those in there, quite nice. Yeah. Uh, I've never actually made it myself. Mm. I'm just sort of recalling the sort of normal ingredients that I kind of have in there. I think it does take a bit of practice to get used to making it yourself, but once you do do it, it's uh, it's not too hard to make. And, you know, I mean, it's mm. you'll probably mess it up a first few times, but... Um, I just got the hang of it. It's quite nice. Uh, yeah, one thing that you can sort of do to uh, potentially uh, forego any sort of possible bitterness from the nuts is uh, you can sort of make it into a kind of date and walnut loaf or date and nut loaf. You add some dates or some other sort of sweet, sugary fruits of the season into it, like yeah, cherry I'm maybe. Yeah, like making it more like cranberry savory to go with like the main meal sort of thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, so if you don't overdo it on the sort of fruits and so on, it does still work. Yeah, but then I'd probably steer away from like putting in dates, probably just putting things like raisins and sultanas maybe just to, and, but, and even then just a sprinkling. Yeah, but you need some like veg in there as well. Normally uh, I'd have a fair amount of onion, some mushroom, um, a bit of oh, yeah, artichoke. Same. I I think I'd yeah I think I'd I think make, not so much not the artichokes but definitely the onions and mushrooms definitely. Yes, indeed. I'm just trying to think what would be my ideal one. I think for me it'd be onions, mushrooms, of course, um, macadamia nuts, cashews, almonds. Um, oh yes. Um, the almonds would probably do for the sweetness, to be honest. Yeah, maybe some monkey nuts as well. Um, and then for seeds, probably a mixture of just pumpkin seeds, um, sesame seeds, and maybe a tiny sprinkle of flax seeds as well. And then uh, mm. and baste it or like um, dust it with like a little bit of like nutmeg and beaten up egg. And uh, maybe a little bit of salt and pepper and... Um, Possibly a tiny bit of chili powder, but and then just leave it at that. Oh yes. And then bake it a bit, and hey presto, you've got a hearty 
jazzy nut roast that you can have with a bit of like stuffing roast tatties, onions and carrots. Why did you rush out there in one of the... Well, I thought I was in the hollow. I didn't realise I was open to every single bullet that anyone cared to fire at me. I was trying to prevent that uh, little uh, Type 64 from doing damage to our flank, but... Yeah, well, I mean, our flank didn't really exist that much anyway to begin with, so... It would... I mean, I think your effort was valiant, but... Yeah. Yes. Oh, wait, is that your is that your landlord's cat I hear in the background? Yes, it is. Hello, girl. Have How... you woken up from your nap? How old is she again? She must be about 17 by now. Oh, wow, in human years, so that means she's like... Yeah. Near enough, like, uh, whew, probably how much would that be in human years? Probably about like 20, 120 in uh, cat years, just over that, probably, wouldn't it? Oh, about that. She's probably in her sort of 80s. She's getting a bit older now. She's a bit insane. No, I, mean, I think, isn't cat years, isn't it like seven for every one human year, or is that just for dogs? I think that's for dogs. Cats, I mean, they mature at sort of different rates and everything, don't they? But yeah, she's basically the equivalent of a 90-year-old. Okay, so she's probably about 85, 19 or so in cat years. Yes, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, that's true. She would be if she's sort of somewhere between 60. Because we don't know her exact age because my landlord's got her from a cat shelter that had found her along with a number of other sort of kittens in a litter. Yeah. But did he get her quite a while ago then? Yes, no, she's been with this family that I'm staying with now sort of for basically all of her life, apart from like the first year or so. Oh, uh, right, okay, so like near enough like 16, 16 and a yeah. half years or so, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I think my nan and granddad had a cat once called Charlie, and he was a very shy cat. Um, I think they had him for the, his entire life, and... I think he ended up living until he was about 16 and a half in human years, so he lived as well for like absolutely ages. He even survived being hit by a car, so he was. Wow. You know, he was, he was very shy and timid, but he was still quite tough for a cat. Um, he he usually just ran away from me because he was usually very shy and quite scared of kids, but um. Yes. I th he did let me pet him a few times, and overall he was a pretty nice cat, actually. He was very chilled out. Just He was just a little bit shy and apprehensive, but um, he was quite cool, actually. Yeah, now my family was uh, never really had a pet. Like, not, not a large one. We had some guinea pigs, but uh, because everybody was out all day, we couldn't really have... Um, I you know, couldn't really have a sort of large pet that needed lots and lots of care all the time. I mean, I know cats don't need as much care as dogs, but they still need some. You can't leave them on their own all the time. No. That's why... I mean, I'd be open to having cats if I got my own place, but I'd probably also be open to having things that require proportionally more or less, rather, um, attention. So something maybe like geckos or t tortoises or... Um, Mm. Maybe even a snake, actually. Um, I've got, I've got, I've grown quite fond of like certain breeds of snake recently, so I'd be open to getting one of those. Mm. Of course, just a small one. Um, yes. But it's just I've seen a few streamers and YouTubers I quite like uh, getting snakes recently, and um, depending on which breed you get, they can be quite nice uh, to have around and very nice, sort of like simple companionship because they're quite they're quite simple creatures snakes i mean their biology and the way they work is fascinating but the way they sort of mm. you know think and sort of feel and go about their day is pretty simple um so yes indeed well they don't reptiles generally don't have very large brains relative to body size mm. now mammals and birds have really large brains reptiles and fish have fairly small ones Relying primarily on instinct. Yeah, that makes sense because they mostly just hibernate, hunt, and. Yes, and also they are very sort of low investment parents. Yeah, that is true. Aren't yeah. they? Their parents. Because a cat will have 
four or five kittens and will put a lot of resources into Feeding protecting them. them and raising them, whereas yeah. snakes will have hundreds of eggs and simply leave them to their own devices. It's just like, yeah, basically it's just right, all right, mum's off to kill some mice now. Pings yeah. off and get your own shit. <laughs> uh, I guess that's why the term sort of cold-blooded creature comes into mind when you're, like, recollecting someone or something that is quite lacking in empathy. Although, to be fair, when you're using it in terms of actually talking about reptiles and snakes and other similarly designed or not designed um similarly evolved creatures in the wild it, it's pretty accurate and it's just a simple descriptor of like their natural nature and just the way they've evolved i don't know why mm. i said design that was just completely the wrong use of phrase but um do you get what i mean i do understand what you mean yes now, they are quite interesting. I particularly like how snakes hear by sensing vibrations in the ground. Yeah. I mean, it's and how a... some of some types of them can sort of detach their lower jaw to widen it out it's quite considerably. Yeah, it's also quite different like, when you're using it to t speak in terms of humans because then you're talking about an actual lack of empathy, whereas snakes and animals, as far as we know, don't aren't really born or evolved with a sense of empathy you know they can feel like pain and fear i guess but no yeah so not it's hard to tell morality. it varies i mean snakes are not social creatures no so they probably don't have much by way of empathy whereas elephants and uh, dolphins dogs even to some extent cats probably do yeah cats are still kind of mental so they are a bit probably a little less prominent with those guys yeah, so interestingly enough, they do show certain characteristics. For instance, my cat constantly sort of nudges me to show affection, and she presses down on either me or sort of like kneading. It's called kneading, and it looks like it. The cat sort of pressing up and down on a pillow or on a person yeah, with her front paws. I've, I've seen and that's because that's what kittens do to try and get milk out of their mothers. I've seen that. So it's interesting because that's yeah. basically the only social behaviour they have, and it's from when they're kittens. I've seen that happen before. Like when I used to have my own cat before he um, passed away quite some years ago, he um, he used to do that a lot of the time when he wanted attention or food, and even sometimes just when he wanted to hug her or something like that. He was, um, I mean, he was a bit of a, he was a bit of an idiot to be honest. He wasn't the smartest cat in the world, but he was very. He was very communicative, and you could tell, sort of like generally speaking, how he was feeling from the way he acted towards you. Yes, indeed. And cats are interesting creatures because it's like dogs aren't seen as very smart, um, but more social. But you know, sometimes they may seem like they know when you're up for attention or not, and they are, at the end of the day, still quite smart creatures because they can do quite considerable skills and tricks if they're trained well enough and cats are naturally generally seen as smarter but at the same time they're still still you know at the end of the day at heart quite social creatures because they're born into packs sometimes if they're out in the world or Mm -hmm. or have like quite social sort of families i've seen cat fathers help with the raising of their young with alongside the mother in question and so that does happen with certain breeds of animals and certain species and when it does it usually shows some sense of empathy i think and um i've definitely seen that happen with cats before Yes, definitely. Well, cats are all very individualistic. You can't sort of make generalizations about them no. in the same way that you can about many other species. Yeah, they've all got their own individual weird personality. It's it's interesting to look at them because they're not like, say, snakes or dogs where they have generally consistent themes of personality um, that have, you know, variations on them here and there, like cats are, by and large, individuals along roughly the same sort of kind of way of thinking as humans are. Not exactly the same, of course, because they're still completely different kinds of creatures at the end of the day, but I guess in the sense that they're still social, they still have families, and they still like having attention and uh, care uh, replicated onto them. Yes, indeed. 
got automatic fire extinguisher that I'll never use. Hmm. I just um, I just sell them whenever I get them. To be honest, it just gives you a bit of extra free credits, which is always useful. Nice. Now, I tend to keep them just in case, but yeah, you know, I very rarely use them because I tend not. Well, I don't get set on fire that much, and yeah. Okay, what are we going in with now? Why don't you pick? I'll um, tell you what. Uh, before we continue with grinding on, uh, sorry, no. Before we continue grinding up my uh, VK and my Yard Panzer Four, how about we go in for something a bit mad? Let's go in with some lower tier vehicles. Oh god, why? Um, yeah, sure, fine. Jesus Christ, what is that thing? Oh, that's the tier two Swedish TD, isn't it? Yes. I forgot what that thing has is like. I am. Um, I used to have that myself, but I got rid of it ages ago. All right, I'll... Yeah, it's horrible, but yeah. it's quite funny. Because it's got... I've upgraded it to the secondary gun that has a 20-round magazine and a rapid rate of fire. Yeah. But it has awful penetration. Oh, yeah, it's... I don't know that I've ever got a kill with this. Yeah, it's a weirdly designed machine, that thing. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just working up to try and get to the higher tier Swedish tank destroyers. Yeah, like the S tank and the um, Starak and the, just the weird ones. The Streetswagen, yes. Yeah, all those lot that just go hold down and then when they're not hold down they're really like not conducive to shooting but go like a rocket. Like, Yes. I think it was a really interesting concept to include that part of them. That, that To be fair, it was actually a feature of the tanks in real life, so... Yeah. I think Definitely. That added not just a sense of realism to what is essentially an arcadey sort of style game, but also an interesting different game mechanic and a different kind of play style altogether, which was quite welcome, actually, I think. Diversified the gameplay up a little bit. Yes. Yes, no, I quite agree. No, it's sort of like the aircraft carriers and warships, they just add something a bit different. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of like the artillery uh, vehicles, like the SPGs of. Um, yeah, that's true. World of Warships, you know, there's to World of Warships essentially what SPGs are to World of Tanks, but at the same time, it's also like playing an RTS while also playing a cross between World of Warships and Battle Stations Pacific, while also playing a cross between that and Cold Waters and. Um, yes, yeah, so or cross between that and uh, this new game that uh, Jingles was demonstrating just a couple of weeks ago, Sky Knights. Yeah, it's it's like it's basically a, a rip off of Top Gun. It's like a cross off cross up between all of those with a little bit of a RTS um, thrown in. Yes. That's kind of why I like playing aircraft carriers on World of Warships so much. Yeah, I think I might like it as well. I think I'm going to go for the American aircraft carrier line. I'm going to go for that as well. I think I started off uh, a little bit trickier with the Japanese Stick with the ones. Japanese destroyers. Yeah, I think with... No, I started off with the Japanese aircraft carriers, but I'm probably going to go for the American ones as well when I get the chance. But, um... The thing is, I think what it is is um, at higher levels, the American and Japanese aircraft carriers are more on level with one another, but at lower levels, the American ones are noticeably better because they've got better dive bombers and fighter planes. Right. Um, but yeah, no, it's like a. Oh, God. Like the fighters at the be beginning on like the first. You know, three or so aircraft carriers on the Japanese line are just a bit. Not. They're not super bad but they're not the strongest necessarily and you do have to get like if you want to go toe to toe with like the American fighters unless it's like a stock American aircraft carrier then I advise getting uh, skills for your commander and also maybe um, upgrades that sort of help your fighters on yeah. your aircraft carrier be it the Hosho or something else have a have a bit of a punch and I'd say that's probably the case for like the first three or so aircraft carriers on the Japanese line so, um, I mean, if you do decide to go down that one, just be warned. But, I mean, I say you probably do it with the American ones as well, because their fighter planes, especially on the lower tier ones, are uh, considerably more um, numerous, shall we say, at the very least, to the Japanese ones, the comparable tier. I mean, there's that one American aircraft carrier, I can't remember, I think it might be the tier 4 one, the Langley, which can spawn, like, two squadrons of, like, seven or so, like, Corsairs, or I, I think it might yes, be... Yes, indeed, I think it's the... Is it, like, the Tier 3 Japanese uh, 
um, aircraft carrier that only has torpedo bombers and fighters. Yeah, and then like you've got the Langley, which spawns just two squadrons of fighters, and then like one big one of t uh, dive bombers. Um, yeah. But it's just it basically it's like the quintessential lower tier aerial superiority ship um, because it if you don't have like say you know an anti aircraft ship like the Cleveland, then having a having a uh, Langley on your side is equally as useful because it just spawns loads of fighters. I th and I think I can't. Don't quote me on this because I haven't unlocked it yet. But I think the fighters on it might be courses. I'll have to check in with that again. But um, either, right. Either way, the fighters on that thing are bloody powerful, and there's loads of them on it as well. It's. It, it, yeah. Does that have the dauntless dive bombers? Possibly. I can't remember. I think. I can't remember if you get the dive bombers at stock level or if you have to upgrade them after playing it a while. But um. God, yeah, it's great for like aerial superiority combat, though. It's really dangerous against other enemy planes. Ah, oh, damn, our base got captured. But yeah, no, it's um, yeah. if you want to go for more like uh, diversified sort of like aerial combat on the World of Warships, then uh, for the first three or so tiers, the Japanese are probably slightly better. But if you want to go for um, Air control and anti destroyer warfare, then the Americans yeah. have probably slightly got a bit of an edge on that at, like, right. for, at, for the first three tiers of their aircraft carriers. No, no, no matter what, your cat, that cat never fucking sounds happy. I know, I know. She's agitated now because she's just been let back in the room and now she's just rubbing herself against my laptop. Anyway. Yeah, I can hear just like the whiskers just brushing against the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, what shall we do now? Do you want to go in with another lower tier or shall we go back up to tier sixes and fives? I don't know. That was quite fun, actually. Let's continue doing it lower tier for a little bit. Okay, I'm going to go in with my tier three artillery. I want to get up to the higher oh, uh, British artillery pieces. Christ, that thing again. Um... Do I have any tier 3 RT? No, I don't think I do. I'll just go with the... Um, um, oh, actually, no, I know what I'll go with. I'll go with the Panzer 1C. I used to play this thing all the time. Oh, yeah. It's 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 basically just got a machine gun, so it's useless against things like the Hetzer or the or the um, AT-1, but it is brutally powerful if you get around the sides of like, lightly armoured ATs and light tanks on lower tier matches. But... um. Yeah, how are you getting on, actually, in general, with World of Warships recently? Oh, with World of Warships? Yeah, no, I'm actually... I mean, I can basically uh, get up to Tier 2 on almost all of my current uh, Tier 1 cruisers that I've got. But, you know, other than when we've been playing it, I haven't really been playing it that much, so I just haven't really got around to it. And, I've been, and I will be able to upgrade um, to a Tier 4 on uh, the American uh, battleship line. Oh, nice. Which think, uh, will be good sort of within the next couple of days, hopefully. I think I, I, I play it probably a little bit more regularly than you. Um, yeah. Hence the reason why I got to uh, tier 5 earlier than, a bit quite some time earlier than you. But um, um, I, I quite like playing it generally as like a bit more of a, like a relaxing sort of game. Even, you know, the direct combat ships like battleships and, you know, destroyers and whatnot. I even find the gameplay in them quite relaxing, even though it can be very intense sometimes, because it's not as, again, not to overuse this word, but it's not as proportionally uh, intense and up up front as uh, the gameplay in World of Tanks, um, which is kind of yeah. why I treat them as kind of very different games, even though they're made in the same sense of style and by the same designer and publisher. It's... Um, it's quite refreshing to switch between the two now and again because World of Tanks is a good arcade game that's great for just team-based combat and just having a bit of a laugh. Whereas World of yeah. Warships is slightly sl a bit more slow-paced, a bit more tactical, just concentrates perhaps a little bit more on the sort of team-based combat and um, it's probably got a slightly greater diversification of combat in it. Not to say that it's inherently a better game, but it's like just very different, you know, so... I think it's, yeah. it's 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 nice to sometimes switch between the two and just ah oh, damn why did I just stand out there in the open but um yes yeah, it's, it's nice to just sometimes switch between the two I think just get a bit of a 
mix up and a change now and again. Uh huh. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, uh, I like warships possibly a bit more than World of Tanks, at least at the moment. But yeah, I, I definitely can. I definitely see that there are advantages to both. I think I like them both just as much as each other, really, as I have done for probably like the last year or two. And I hold them both in pretty high regard, so I don't mind playing either of them really with either by myself or with my mates. So because they're both well-made games, I mean they have yeah. their, I mean they have their problems, of course, but every game does. And as as many times as wargaming have screwed up in the past, I think like they're at least more receptive to issues they might have in their games or that they might be doing with their own conduct than some other di uh, directors and publishers. Gearbox! Yeah, so, you know, they, they, they've, they've got their flaws, but they they could be way worse. No, what, what's your what's your take on that? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, they've even sort of, from what I can tell, I haven't actually gone back and played it, but from what I've heard, they've actually uh, improved World of Warplanes considerably. Mm. And yeah, I mean, compared to uh, lots of other free-to-play games online, even you know, they've definitely given they definitely give you a lot for your money. Yeah, and. As much as there is an emphasis on like uh, premium sort of stuff, uh, be it credits, premium credits, yeah. account or premium vehicles, it's like you know, d get, using those things does help you progress in the different games quite a lot. But it's not like absolutely essential. I feel no, totally, and it doesn't actually affect the combat so much. Well, it does to in the game. It affects how far you can progress to, to sort of for what level. But the combat itself doesn't really matter that much in terms. Well, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Well, it does to a certain extent, but I think what balances it out is the fact that there are so many vehicles in each game that can take on each of the premium vehicles in each game mm. um, to a comparable extent that there's at least enough counters to each premium tank or ship or aircraft that you don't feel like it's too imbalanced. I think. The only really times I can think of where there's been a premium vehicle that has been really imbalanced that's needed either removing or total rebalancing has been, say, the Type 59, which was limited to just the Chinese server and then was also rebalanced quite a bit. Or the, yes. or, or the E25, which was just removed from the gift shop altogether from the uh, European and Russian servers. I mean, I, I remember actually, um, I heard about that news uh, a couple of years ago before they were going to remove the E25 from the World of Tanks gift shop and I immediately just sprang into action and bought it because I was just like hmm. I don't care, I need this, G give it to me give it to me now I'm now on 89% on my second set of crew skills on that thing so I've been quite enjoying it I haven't played it as much as I probably should have done but still enjoying it quite a bit from time to time Yeah, I don't know about the E25 so much but I wish they hadn't nerfed the Yag Panzer IV because it's Did not they? just sort of... Inter yeah, didn't they nerf the gun on it because it used to be a lot better? Oh, yeah, it used to have quite a... Uh, I mean, it still has the 88mm, but it's um, just a slightly lower velocity, slightly lower pen one that's um, just yeah. not quite as good. It's still accurate and relatively fast firing, but yeah, it's velocity and pen are somewhat downgraded. Yeah, and I think they also maybe downgraded the armor rating on this thing. I'm not. I don't have any firm evidence. Well, yeah, for that, but the Phil, come on, like the armor on the Jagdpanzer IV has never been good. Yeah, true. I mean, it's always been mainly about stealth and firepower that thing. So, and yeah. so, so to a certain extent, and speed as well, because in a straight line, it's I find it's quite quick. Yeah, definitely it is. Yeah, I mean, you, you've you've had that thing for quite a while now, actually, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Well, this is this is what I sort of think. This is my main one of my main issues with World of Tanks, and possibly it will be with World of Warships as well. It's that progressing, you know, from tier one up to tier five and six is simple enough. You know, you just do it. But I mean, yeah, I've had, like you say, I've had this for going on two years now, and I'm only halfway to getting enough credits to buy the next one mm -hmm. in the line. Well, to be fair, that's also because you're more you're more reticent to buy premium tanks than I am. You've been playing the 
game for much less time than I am. You even then you play it much less frequently than I do. That's true. Um, and I think, and I mean, I'm not saying this necessarily in defence of like, uh, you know, the way the game was designed or the people who made it, but it's just, I'm just saying it as in a sense of, it's just the way things are. That um, yeah, that's kind of how the game was designed. It was designed so that it was always designed so that f- ranking up from tier one to tier five would always be um, a reasonably quick process, which you could do within one or two weeks. Um, making all of the tanks at like the bottom half of like the t- uh, tech trees very accessible, very easy to get into. By which time you've had enough time to like experiment with the bottom five tanks on um, some of the tech trees. You're more drawn into a larger number of like playstyles in the game, so you want to experiment a bit more, explore a bit more, get into like different routes of progressing through the game. So I think I'm not saying it's necessarily the be all and end all way of doing a free to play game but it's it's just the way things are really that's the way it was designed and i mean to be honest with you i personally think it's quite a good way of designing it because if they just made it progress right through i mean it's admittedly it's not good to have everything locked behind a paywall or make it like really hard to progress even without a paywall but um at the same time, I think it's also a good idea to like have a balance between the two. Make it accessible and easy to progress for a certain period or stretch, but also have a sense of like difficulty curve and um, earning your progression more than anything. Because I feel like it's more rewarding when I earn stuff like a new tank or gun than just am given it. I know, maybe I'm getting a bit long-winded about it, but I just feel like it's by design, and it's not like it was a design that was just whipped up in an afternoon. Yeah, no, I get your, I get your point. I mean, let's face it, would you rather have a free-to-play game like World of Tanks, that has some microtransactions in it, some premium aspects in it, but there are not necess- there aren't really that essential to progress far into the game although they do you know help us to a certain extent yeah. or would you rather have a game like evolve where arguably you can progress to the same extent but more of it is locked and there's you know you know just the same sort of you know like, there's probably more customization in individual aspects of your character but it also takes more grinding and more spending to um, progress through each uh, aspect of levelling up. Yeah, definitely. World of Tanks is superior. I mean, doesn't isn't Evolve uh, sort of uh, normal, like, uh, pay purchase price, and then there's all sorts of microtransactions as well? Well, that was the kind of tragic thing. It's like, no, they had made it out to be like that it was an accessible full-price game in the same style of, like, gameplayers. Or, like, concept as like uh, you know something like Yeti Hunter Star Wars um, Battlefront basically no no, I didn't no Yeti Hunter or or, uh, Left 4 Dead 2 Um, but it was like a team fighting one big creature that they had to hunt down and contain and such and fight the local wildlife along the way yeah Um, but they kind of underplayed the free to play. Uh, th- uh, sorry, they underplayed the microtransactions aspect of it. Um, in a f- which you know, in a f- full price game, is usually a bit more frowned upon than in a free to play game or a discount game. So it already had like a bit of bad blood towards it from the community to begin with, and then people found out just how essential those microtransactions were towards progressing through the game. Anyway, it's like not like in World of Tanks where it helps. Uh, a fair bit. It was like in some p- places it was really m- the main way to progress through certain aspects of leveling up. And then after a while, they realised the game was losing so many projected sales copies and its uh, player base was dying out so fast that they discounted the game a couple of times, cut out. I think they cut it out season passes at one point, and then eventually they made it just free to play. But like nowadays, it's just got like an almost dead player base with barely even a few hundred people playing it world worldwide. And I think the um, developers even cut off um, actual like technical support for it after only like about a year and a half. So 
it was like it was ambitious, but in the end they implemented their microtransaction thing. I think in not the best way, and were just a bit ambitious with it overall. Yeah, it's I tell like, you one free, it's one like, other free to it's play game. Like, um, it's cut. Sorry to interrupt, but it's kind of like yeah. if if anyone is thinking of putting microtransactions in it, I'm not. Like I said before, I'm not inherently against them, depending on what kind of game it's in. But just use Evolve as kind of like a cautionary tale. Yeah. Sorry, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt uh, intentionally. Um, what were you going to say? I was going to talk about um, another uh, free-to-play game that I tried that uh, wasn't sort of all that based around microtransactions and possibly now might uh, be sort of a slightly different story, but uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Mm. No, sorry, Star Wars The Old Republic, I mean... The sort of um, MMORPG based on the Knights of the Old Republic games. Oh yeah, that was a funky old thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was widely praised for its story, and I can understand why. And apparently it has the most recorded dialogue of any game ever. Really? Yeah, apparently. They just, they just had to record so much dialogue for all the different tangents that the story could take. There are just so many of them. But because it's sort of your traditional RPG with sort of numbers-based combat, it was next to impossible for sort of entry-level players to level up without paying money in first-hand. And you just that, sort of think, well, you know, just... I'd rather buy a full-price game for that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it'd probably be just easier to, you know, buy Skyrim and maybe put a Star Wars mod on it, basically. So Yeah. That's the gist of it. Either that, or buy Star Wars Galaxies, and I mean, like, no one wants to buy Star Wars Galaxies because that was a giant turd pile. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Um, it what's the name? Uh, Star Trek Online. Yeah, that was um, could have been worse, but it also could have been a lot better. That one, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I think Jingles uh, again did a few videos on that of some time ago, but um. Oh well, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, it was quite. It was like a couple of years ago, at least. Now it's quite a while ago, but um, I think again, that's another one where it, it had a promising beginning, and the first year or two of it was very, very profitable for the developer and very well received. But um, it probably. I mean, to be fair, its drop off didn't happen in anywhere near as dramatic a way as, like, say, Evolves did. But it was. Um, it's just kind of sort of slowly faded away over time. I think. Yeah, now that whole game kind of passed me by, to be quite honest. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I'm not criticising World of Tanks for that, mm. not at all. And, you know, to be fair, you know, if I work really hard for the next tank, then I'm sure I'll love it all the more. Yeah, like I said, it's kind of a sense of sort of achievement and earning your progression. Um, I mean, I can understand why people don't like it and why they don't like the way you progress, but it's just like... I always say, it's you know it's the way it was designed. The progress, the um, design, the people who made it are reasonably good at like listening to community concerns, and if anything, they're better than the EA or Gearbox who just yeah do not. That goes without saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, oh god, I mean, as far as I'm aware, they haven't done anything that Gearbox has done in regards to what. Gearbox did with developing clone, uh, aliens, colonial marines, and Duke Nukem. Where, oh they, yeah, they took some of their staff off of the team that was working on colonial marines to work on Duke Nukem Forever. But while the people who were working on Duke Nukem Forever were working on that game, they pocketed the uh, weekly uh, funds that, or weekly wages that those people would have been earning for themselves if they had been working on. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Aliens, colonial marines. Oh, right. So basically just, like, nicking money, and eventually, and because they were doing that and because they were splitting up the teams, Aliens, Clone Marines, like, delayed, like, two more times after they'd taken over a production of it, and as a result, it came out, like, <laughs> five years late and half as finished as it was meant to be, so they uh, ended up being sued. And wow. it ended up going pretty much completely bankrupt. So Yeah, well, that's like EA, now isn't it because you know basically the system in terms of the way the game works and how you progress mm. shit um you know it's basically it's so close to being gambling that the u.s prosecution office is actually investigating whether or not it might actually be gambling yeah although 
I mean, I was I was using the case of Gearbox more as like a, just a cautionary tale of just generally not being a scumbag and when you're designing a game because there's no painting it. The way they designed and managed the production of um, Aliens, Colonial Marines, and Duke Nukem Forever was pretty scummy and yeah. As and they they're nowhere near as big of a um, company as a uh, EA are. So it's kind of a different kettle of fish with them and a different issue really because theirs was more about like. Um, immoral practice and uh you know the embezzlement of like money and such whereas like ea is like you said is more about like gambling and in-game transactions yeah definitely although i do feel like again i, I kind of think i kind of mentioned this a, couple, a few weeks ago in one of my previous uh episodes of the get cast podcast i think it was one of the solo episodes where i kind of said like look i can understand why people don't like microtransactions and loot boxes but it re you can't just like label them all as all inherently bad because generally speaking it might be better if they weren't there but at the same time it's like it depend I think it really depends on what kind of game it is what the gameplay is like uh, how much reward you get from buying these microtransactions and loot boxes and how necessary they are um, I mean in you know game like Star Wars Battlefront two uh, remake that came out recently it's you know it's not that necessary and a bit overpriced I th I'd say yeah probably uh, I know I know everyone has different views on it but I just feel like that's probably the most balanced way of looking at it because you can't just label every single instance as the same because let's face it as much as people criticise the microtransactions in wargaming's games they're nowhere near as bad as the ones in EA's yeah, that's true, but I mean, in total fairness to EA, no, their full-price $120 game, I don't you, know, think you, you could buy two Tier 10 premium tanks in World of Tanks for that money. You know, yeah. just two tanks in a game for the same as their sort of massive overpriced fanboy bait. Yeah, but it's yeah. different sense, like proportional sort of um, rewards you get from it, because... The game playing Battlefront 2 is arguably more repetitive and... There's well, World of Tanks is fairly repetitive. Yeah, but it's also much more situational, so there's probably going to be a bit more variation on those re repeated situations. Um, I mean, there's going to be a lot of stereotypes and continuations of certain trends, but like, I'd say it's still more um, variable than uh, Battlefront 2. Um, and plus it's like, yeah, you're right about sort of like the the amount of surplus you get from the two examples you get being a bit more in balance of like towards EA. But at the same time, it's like, think about how much enjoyment and progression you'd get out of either two of them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you get more enjoyment out of World of Tanks, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, shall we switch to another topic of conversation? I think we've covered this one pretty thoroughly, haven't we? Yeah, and I've already made a couple of podcast episodes on it in recent weeks anyway, so probably just yeah. stepping common ground and uh, recent, recently trod tracks recently. So, recently trod tracks recently, that was verbal diarrhoea. Um, I know, right? Jesus, why did I say it like that? But, um... God, yeah. Actually, what I was going to say is, um... Yeah. I was going to say actually, speaking of like abundance and like personal preference, and also tie into the earlier discussion about uh, Christmas. Yes. What do you feel is like the optimal time and the optimal amount to like put up Christmas decorations around shops? Because I noticed this year huh. that because um, like the thing is, with like games like World of Tanks and Overwatch, they usually put up their Christmas decorations in game. You know, the Christmas garage, Christmas themed menu, you know, quite close to Christmas within like the last couple of weeks before the day. But um, in real life, like in shopping malls and whatever around where we are at the moment, yeah, I find they do it like way in advance. Like I started seeing Christmas uh, decorations in Brighton being put up around fucking like a week before Halloween even. So... You know, yeah. over, over like six, six and a half weeks ago now. So it's like, I don't know. What's what's your what's your 
uh, well take I grew on that. up in a sort of fairly well not sort of really not strict religious household but a household that was sort of informed by religious practices and according to that you put up your Christmas decorations on the first day of Advent basically is that what day is that then well that's either the first of December or the first Sunday in Advent so the fourth Sunday before Christmas depending on which comes first so it's usually something like I guess like first December or like right at the crack end of like November or something yeah pretty much yeah, which sense. seems reasonable to me but I don't know I've noticed I sort of thought this year they'd been a bit more restrained with their Christmas stuff from the shops and so on as in they started it all a bit later yeah no I mean I'm saying like the first ebbs of it I saw were like around like the end of Oct or like around late October but yeah yeah, I think it really kicked into overdrive in mid-November, but even then I'd say that's a bit early. Like, I'd say earliest I'd rather have it up is, like, right at the end of November, but um, hmm. it's just, like, pretty soon enough, like, West Street and, like, Church of Square shopping centre were, like, bestowed in, like, Christmas decorations way before Chris, way before the Christmas uh, break-up had even happened uh, at Sussex Uni, so I was like, this feels... um. A little premature. I mean, yes. Maybe it's coming. Yeah, you know, I am coming from the perspective of someone who isn't religious um, currently, but it's just like I don't know. It just feels like a little bit premature to me. Well, I don't know that religion really has that much to do with it. I mean, in many ways, religious people are probably going to be less likely to have the Christmas decorations up early. No, that's um, true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can see why businesses would do it because they need to sort of start attracting the customers for the sort of Christmas shop sort of a bit earlier than, say, you know, everybody puts up their own personal Christmas decorations. Mm. Yeah, so I can see the logic behind doing that. I mean, it's like uh, the Christmas markets, you know, the Christmas market in Jubilee Square by the library down in Brighton. That one opened sort of mid-November or something. Um, and, you know, you've got to have it because otherwise it's just not worth the time of opening the whole thing. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. It's, I guess, do you think there's also a sense of proportional timing and um, uh, placement to a certain extent? Like, say, with certain, you know, places and, um, and uh, you know, in senses of important, importance on the whole thing in certain places, that it depends on that to a certain extent as well? Um... I can't say I'm really an expert on it, but I can see that, uh, you know, shops are going to put up the sort of usual kind of Christmas adverts a bit for. And maybe we should draw a distinction between sort of actual religious symbolism and Christmas decorations and the sort of commercial aspects Well, you're a, bit more knowledgeable about, you're a bit more knowledgeable about that than I am, so. Yeah. I mean... I just think that businesses are obviously going to do it because it's more financially advantageous. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, private individuals sort of normally will generally just go away, you stupid cat. Oh, damn it. <laughs> killed me. Uh. Oh, dear. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, strictly liturgically speaking, you should at the earliest put up your Christmas decorations at the start of Advent and then you take them down promptly on the 6th of January, mm. which is after the 12 days of Christmas. Yeah. yeah. And if we're going to be really formal about it, there's sort of a specific time when you have to have different coloured Christmas decorations as well. Oh, I don't think I'd personally go Because uh, purple is actually the, the, the uh, liturgical colour of Advent. So you shouldn't technically have purple coloured Christmas decorations up outside of Advent. So you need to remove them after Christmas and then you're not allowed to have them up before Advent. So, you know, there's all sorts of complicated rules for it. I don't think, to be honest, I'd probably bother with it that much if, if it really came to it. But I can see why some would, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just, yeah, I don't know. I just, it's just you know, it's something that I roll my eyes at when you see it up in the shops 
two months before Christmas. But, you know, to a certain extent, it's understandable why that would be the case. And there's... Yeah, that's what I was talking about mainly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no sort of reason to get particularly upset about it. There's no... No. Yeah, like 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 it's all like everyone always says. It's not forcing you to buy anything. Though I can understand why, for people for whom Christmas is a fairly stressful time, um, they might uh, not be as enthusiastic to see it up that early. It might sort of feel like they're being put under even more stress than they normally are mm. around Christmas time. Because for some people, it really is actually quite an quite an ordeal to get everything ready. If you have, I don't know, a really large family or if you sort of often do, if you're sort of a bit more sociable in the Christmas season, if you're hosting and going to umpteen parties. Got I to do keep like in touch me some uh, Christmas and New Year's parties, though. Especially if like there's some mulled wine and mince pies going around. Yeah, that's true. Although, oh, actually, God, speaking of mulled uh, drinks... Um, me uh, a couple of weeks ago when we met up, when me and Phil met up before the uh, week eleven meeting of the Sussex Sci-Fi and Horror Society meeting. Um, before that, we went into Falmer Bar, which is on uh, again on the Sussex Uni campus. I remember you got me a glass of that um, mulled cider. Of course, you know different from mulled wine because it's cider wine, you know. But um. God, I wouldn't mind if if I see something like that in like waitress or something before Christmas Day. I'm definitely going to get like a bottle or two of that. Hmm. Yes. Now I might. Well, I've got my. I might actually try and make myself a bit of my own or a bit of mulled wine at any rate because I have a load of um. Uh, what do you call them? Uh, not capers. Uh, what are they called? Those kind of star-shaped seed pods. Oh, God, I know which ones you're on about. I, c I can't remember. I'm yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of them as well. They sort of taste a bit like aniseed, but they're not aniseed. Mm. Yeah, so I have a load of those. I've got some uh, oranges. I've got a bottle of reasonable wine. And then I've got a bit of fruit juice and a few spices. So I can sort of boil all that up. And hopefully it will taste decent. I'm just going to try doing that. I'm, I'm going to probably try and make some... Um mulled whiskey at some point over the holidays like get a bottle of like reasonably but like reasonably cheap whiskey like maybe some home brown stuff or some jack daniels or something like that and then mix it with like you know like some honey some apple juice some you know yeah uh, f some flax seeds and maybe some a bit of you know a few sorts of uh spices and sliced up orange and all that or probably more likely sliced up apple actually and then um mm. some cinnamon sticks mix it around simmer it a bit and then just serve it up like that it'd probably be quite nice yeah that's true i should add cinnamon to it that's that's a good idea i was going to add pepper but cinnamon will probably be better no, don't don't add pepper add cinnamon sticks that i think that probably suit the flavor probably a bit more if you're making something that's meant to be mm. mold yes you're right no, i just know that the romans used uh pepper in their kind of spiced wine at, in winter time yeah, but they're the Romans. They they were they were uh, mad in certain areas, geniuses, but mad. Yeah, particularly in culinary terms. Yeah, some of the culinary. Uh, I mean, just I think that's probably the first thing that stood out to me when I first took an interest at a young age on the study of uh, Roman or ancient Roman culture. I should say is their yes. culinary exploits, which some of them you can kind of understand. Like mixing ham with like honey and all that, but then some are just outright bizarre. Like, oh God, I can't remember. Like the stuffed door or the rotten sheep. I mean, the rotten fish sauce. Yeah, or like, I actually remember what that's called. Or like the jellied chicken or something like that. It's just some of them are just weird. Hmm. But yeah, I think probably the rotten like fish thing is probably the weirdest one I'd say. Yeah. So the stuffed door mice are probably a strong contender. Yeah. Oh god. Yeah, that was weird. I mean, I mean, well, it was ancient Rome. There was fucking like vermin all around the place because, you know, it's just nowhere near the same sort of like design of sanitation. Although to be fair, sanitation in the Roman times was probably, well, like, no, it was just a bit more efficient than, uh, at the very least, than in medieval times. 
Yeah. Definitely. No, I mean, they are quite strange, like, particularly in terms of sanitation. You think about their public toilets, yeah. the way they worked. You know, like, uh, the fact that it was such an open and social occasion is quite a strange concept to us. Yeah. I mean, I guess in comparison, again, to like the many countries in Europe in the Middle Ages, and also a large number of the, the barbarian sort of tribes that they faced off against at the height of their empire, their sort of uh, type of sanitation, irrigation and um, cleaning was comparatively very advanced, but even still, compared to now, it was still incredibly primitive at the end of the day. Yes. I, I think that's part of the reason why I liked uh, reading about Roman uh, history so much when I first started on it. It's, it's got so many aspects you can recognise from a modern perspective. But I know, I know, that's what I always think. But they're so like primitive in like a side-by-side -side comparison, even though the principle is still, at the end of the day, moderately the same. Yes, indeed. I mean, looking at uh, their military and governance structure, looking at their architecture, particularly their concept. That is a strange noise going on there. But, uh, yeah. I do. Hang on, what's this? Oh, what, dear, what's going on? What heinous oh, my theory. Goodness. Oh, God. Uh, it's just my cat. She's playing with a random bit of stuff on the floor. All right, okay. I thought it was just something actually serious for a sec. No, no, nothing serious. Yeah. Yeah, no, I... What got me into Roman history was the uh, Roman Mysteries book by... Um, the, Ro uh, the Roman Mysteries series by... What's her name? Is it Suzanne Collins? Oh, no, yeah. No, that's Hunger Games, isn't it? Um... Yeah, Hang no, on, I'll I, look I, it up. Yeah, I didn't think it was her, but um, I know the series you're talking about. Yes, hang on. Um, the T3485 on our team just got an amazing top gun, though. He had yeah, a, I saw him. So, yeah. He had a blinder of a match, that guy. Carolyn Lawrence, that's it. Oh, yeah, that is it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I didn't. I probably didn't read those books as much as you did, but I can um, definitely see the inspiration from them. Yes, now they just always really uh, fascinated me because they gave such a good window into the ancient world. Mm. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, it was always Roman military history that fascinated me, at least at first. But then the more I got into it, the more I liked just learning about their society. I particularly liked the chariot races, the way it's kind of a parallel to football in modern culture. The way, there's, the way they had the team identity, the team mindset, the way every single town would have had, every single reasonably sized town would have had chariot races and they formed a big part of people's daily lives. Yeah, they were sort of like... That, that that day's like equivalent of like I guess F one to a certain extent, um, and you know gladiator combat was like their day's version of like football to a certain extent because they had like I don't know I'd say that uh, um, I'd say the gladiator combat was less like football because the football to, football today really has this sort of team mindset in it. It's quite tribal really with different colours and different classes and groups of people associated with it and that really was what the chariot races were like like uh, the blues and greens were typically sort of the top teams they were supported by the more upper class people the blues had kind of a reputation for cheating whereas the greens sort of didn't they were generally the most popular white ones were generally associated with workers and lower class the white uh, chariot team were generally associated with workers and lower class people and the reds were associated with soldiers and sailors mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it really is based on sort of class mindset and differences of where you come from and so on. And, you know, the best charioteers and the best horses got sold from team to team, just like the best players do these days. And, yeah, it was big business. Uh, 
guess that's probably more accurate. I guess then gladiator combat was probably a bit close to something like a cross between MMA and boxing. Yeah, probably, because it was much more about the individual, and it was much more theatrical, which was always quite interesting to me. But what I really liked about ancient Rome was, was their religion, because in a way they're a fairly secular society. They're a very rigid and hierarchical society, but they're not as religious in the same way as the ancient Greeks. It doesn't inform sort of every aspect of their lives. No, there's a, certainly a bit more individuality in ancient Roman society than the uh, form of ancient Greek society five or six hundred years earlier. Yes, indeed. Certainly in like most terms, like compared to ancient Athens. Yeah, and I mean, even though Greek ancient Greek society was arguably more uh, pivotal to the formation of the idea of democracy, the Roman... Um, Roman society was much more pivotal to the formation of the concept of political allegiance and affiliations and ideologies. So, Yes, in a way, there's definitely this sort of, we see the beginnings of arguably a conflict between liberalism and authoritarianism yeah. in the Roman Senate. But it is still a patriarchal society where people adhere more to individuals than to particular parties, at least in the uh, sort of earlier or at least by the sort of later Roman Republic and during the Empire. I know, but then again, you've got to keep in mind, like that, that was like the first time when that those concepts were being brought up as a codified sort of like response to the way that the Greeks had done things. Yes, well, not, not, yes, not codified. I, I mean, solidified. And I meant to say, like, it wasn't like written down in stone or anything. So, but um, yeah, yeah, no, the uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans are fascinating to compare against each other in terms of what they invented, both theoretically and like pra actually like practically as well. Got the L60 is a pile of crap. Um, yeah, I know. I just got pounded by that M7 priest. Again, sexual connotations, Phil. Think about what you're saying. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Goodness me. Right. Well, I think that's probably a good place to end it, to be honest, because we've covered... I think so, yeah. We covered a fair array of topics once again. Yeah, and we didn't yeah. just sort of, like, haphazardly jump from one another to the next. It's like we uh, managed to keep it relatively stable of a conversation throughout uh, for most Yeah, and it's it. good that we can do this, particularly when it's so when it's such a short period of time since our last one. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is, like... The last one was only uploaded recently. It was recorded like about a week and a half before I uploaded it because... Um, That's true. Because I was having, uh, I think like I said in the video description of a uh, Gitcast episode 12, that I was having uh, technical issues with my processing and editing software, which I must apologise to the people I'm about, so yeah, what can you do? But uh, hopefully this one will be out a bit sooner after it's recorded, so you know, just wait and see what we can do. Yes, indeed. Well, in that case, I think um, we've got nothing left to say other than to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, or yeah. whatever holidays you celebrate. Yeah, and we, be it Eid, you know, Hanukkah, or anything else outside of, you know, the uh, old Abrahamic religions, just have fun, stay safe with whatever you're doing, and just, you know, be kind to everyone, and just be chill, and don't drink too much if you are into drinking alcohol, you know, just, I mean... Yeah. Get get wasted, but you know, don't do it too crazily. But... I love that. Drink alcohol, get wasted, but not too much. Yeah. That's great advice. It's like three Yeah, options. take some time to hang out with your family, talk to elderly relatives if you have them so they don't feel lonely this time of year. And give something to maybe someone who's a bit more in need at this time of year because you know, this time of year is kind of a bit rough for people who are who are a bit more needy than us, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, you're probably right. Check out your like local food banks if you can help there, or local homeless shelters or soup kitchens, and just even if you just do a couple of days of volunteering this Christmas period, just see how you can help out. And like Phil said, whichever celebration or like religious event you celebrate, depending on which religion you belong to or which sect of it you belong to, have fun, stay safe, and just have a happy new year as well. On top of that, I uh, and. I'll be leaving a link to Phil's channel in the video description below, as well as my other YouTube channels and my uh, social media platforms as well, so please check them out if you guys are interested 
If you did like this uh, podcast, be sure to leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you do have any ideas for future discussion topics or what we should do on this channel, be sure to let me know in the comment section below. But as me and said have me and Phil have said and reiterated many times now, have a great holiday season, have a great New Year's, stay safe, have fun with whatever you're doing. Don't do anything we wouldn't do. And until next time, I've been Git Bag Great. Now with Flash Suppressor. With yeah, my ever loyal, if not uh, yeah, ever loyal companion, Hi. Flash Suppressor. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we'll see you guys... Who's the one with the innuendos again? Oh, shut up. It, we, and we'll see you guys on the battlefield in 2018. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Yeah, that was probably a good about enough way to end it for the year. I think so. That was